Hello and welcome back for part two of JMRI signaling with Digitrax hardware. In part one we left off after I drew the track schematics on layout editor and linked the segments to the proper sensor addresses. In this part I will show you how to add the signal head icons to the layout editor, give a brief description on the differences between automatic and controlled signals, explain my method of using simple signal logic rather than using signal masts, and edit the signal head logic to protect blocks, switches, and other signals. Okay, so let's get started. Open JMRI Panel Pro and go to Panels. Click on Open Panels and find the file name of your project. I named mine Test Track. This will bring up the Layout Editor window and populate the tables with all the turnout and sensor addresses that we entered in Part 1. The states of some of the turnout, sensor, and signal head tables may be listed as unknown. You can just reset them by clicking on the uh, buttons manually to change their state. Let's add the signal head icons to the layout editor panel. Click the checkbox next to signal head icon and type in the name of the signal you want to plant. I'll start with the signal 289A1. A word to note. This text must be exactly what you name the signal head in the signal head table. Right click to bring up the options menu and rotate this head icon 180 degrees. Add 289A2 and rotate it as well. Add signal 289B and 289C, but we can see they are already facing the correct direction. Right click and hold the icon and you can drag it around the panel. I moved mine to where they looked like they would be on the diorama. You can see here that I protected the switch by making it its own detection section. By placing the signals at the entrances to the section, I created an OS. In the early days of railroad dispatching, OS had different definitions for each individual railroad. For some, it stood for on switch, while others it meant out of station. In modern signaling practices, it still refers to the track at an interlocking within the protective limits of these boundaries, or home signals. The track and signal equipment altogether is called an interlocking, or what Union Pacific refers to as a control point. Control points are interlocked in such a way that prevents the dispatcher from taking unsafe actions in routing trains. By detecting the switch separately and protecting it with home signals, we can power the switch with a motor and give remote control of that switch to the dispatcher. The dispatcher is usually located many miles away from the track that they govern and cannot physically see whether a switch is safe to throw or not. Imagine what would happen if the dispatcher threw the switch under a moving train. In model railroading, where it's all made up and the points don't matter, maybe there's not a real need. But in real life, it allows railroads to be safer while also allowing them to be more productive. My goal in model railroading is to simulate, within reason, most of what the prototype does. Now on a branch line that handles maybe one or two trains a day, signals and motorized switches probably aren't needed. But in a line handling several trains at once, meaning trains at passing sidings in many different directions, that equipment makes a little more sense. Trains can only move on the main line when they are authorized. This is called main track authority. Some main tracks can be authorized through yard limits, through restricting limits, maybe track warrant control, uh, and then Lastly, centralized traffic control, or what we call CTC. This is where our focus will be with this diorama. CTC allows a dispatcher to authorize a train to move from one control point to the next based on signal indication. Therefore, all home signals are held at a stop indication, or red, until the dispatcher sends the request to release that hold in the requested direction. When the route is safe for the train to proceed, the field equipment physically located at the control point is what actually releases the hold on that signal and allows it to go to a different aspect other than red. 
If, however, the route is not safe due to a conflicting train on its way or the switch is thrown against that train, so on and so forth, the signal will remain held at red. Using CTC on a model railroad then would help avoid cornfield meets, uh, lessen confusion for no new operators. They would just have to follow the, the symbol colors on the signals, whether they could go stop or slow down, and allow the dispatcher to handle more trains moving on the main line at one time. Signals located between control points are called intermediate signals. These signals are automatic, changing their aspect based on track and signal conditions ahead, and default to their least restrictive aspect. They are not controlled by the dispatcher and can usually be identified by a number plate fixed to their mast. As we start to link our signal heads to the track in the layout editor window, they too will default to their least restrictive aspect and operate as automatic signals. In part three of this series, we will build the dispatcher interface, write the needed logic to hold the home signals to red and enable the route functions on the dispatcher interface used to clear a route through a control point. Start by right clicking on signal 289A1. Click on edit logic and a new window opens. This signal is located at the switch that we want to protect. This being the top head of the signal, it governs the route on the straight part of the switch and the track beyond. While the bottom head, 289A2, governs the diverging part and the track into the siding. Select main leg of turnout. The sensors to protect are LS104, which is the detection section for the switch, and LS103, which is the section on the main. By entering this, if either of those two sections are occupied, the top signal will remain red. The next line down says, red when turnout is thrown. The address of my turnout is LT1. Now if the switch is thrown for the siding, this too will cause the top signal to be red. Leave the rest blank for now, we'll come back to that later. Click apply to save the changes and X out of that window. Right click on the 289A2 head and do the same. However, the sensors the bottom head protects is the switch section 104, but now also LS101 since that's the section in the siding. Click apply and close that window. Next, we will move on to 289B. This signal only has one route through the switch. Naturally, it's the straight route. It protects LS104 and the main track to the left, which is LS102. Do 289C, select diverging leg of turnout, and it protects the same sections as 289B. Uh, now put your locomotive on and run it through each section. The signals now should respond accordingly. Throw the switch and the top head should go red while the bottom one goes green. At every step along the way while programming your signal system, Please, please, please remember to save often. I can't stress that enough how frustrating it is to close out your JMRI software or for your computer to shut down and reboot and lose a lot of the work that you just got done programming. So please, please, please save your work often. Hopefully at this point you are enjoying watching your locomotive go up and down the track, passing the signals and watching them drop to red just like the real thing. There is one major thing my diorama is lacking, and that's mainly due in part that it's a little on the small side, and that's other signals further down the line. The signals we have here will happily show red if the block is occupied, or green if it's clear. But to get a yellow, there would need to be another signal down the line protecting the next block. If that block were occupied, its signal would have been red. In that scenario, our signal then would have shown a yellow. We can simulate this by adding virtual signal heads to the layout window. The real signals on the diorama would look ahead to these simulated signals just as if they were physically on the layout. Then by setting the virtual signals to different aspects, our real signals would then respond accordingly. So to do this, 
Go to the signal heads table like we did before. Click Add, but in the system type, select Virtual. The system name needs to start with an LH. The username can be anything you want. I start mine with a V, that way it's kind of a reminder that it's a virtual signal, not a real signal. So I'll call the new one V102 and plan on having that one go at the end of block that is protected by sensor LS102. Uh, I'll also make one that's V103 and V101, and those virtual signals on the layout panel will then go uh, to the edges of those blocks. Go back to the layout editor window and add those heads the same way that we did the heads earlier. Place them at the ends of the blocks we named after them. Rotate them as needed. Uh, virtual signals start out showing dark, so clicking on the head icon will cycle them through the different colors. Because they're not real, no command is actually being sent out over LocoNet. Don't forget to save your work. Let's update the logic for each head. For 289A1, it's going to be looking at the signal at the end of main track, which is signal V103. So in the protects signal field, type in V103. Do the same for the other three heads. Just make sure that the text that you enter in that field is identical to the name that we used for the virtual signals. Now would be a good time to explain the other options on this window. Checking the box called Limited Speed limits that head to only show red or yellow. If you check the box next to With Flashing Yellow, that enables the signal to show a flashing yellow ahead of a yellow signal. This would be called 4 block protection and is employed differently from one main line to the next. And also not all railroads use the flashing yellow, so it's really prototype specific. Checking the box is distant signal will force this signal to duplicate whatever aspect the signal being protected is showing. Finally, entering a sensor address in the approach lighting sensor field will keep this signal dark until that detection section is occupied. Thanks for watching. Now let's move on to part 3 and finish up.